Hello, everybody, and welcome to Reinvent Money. My name is Paul Buitink, and today I have a real treat for you because I'm talking to former Fed trader and author of the amazing book, Central Banking 101, Joseph Wang. Hi, Joseph. How are you? Hey, hey Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, you're one of the leading experts on central banking, and uh, I can't wait to deep dive into understanding the tectonic shifts that are currently happening in our monetary system. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about what you did at the Fed and, and when did you work there? Sure. So I was a trader on the open markets desk. Believe it or not, the Fed actually has a trading desk and it's a kind of an important part of the Fed. It's where the Fed conducts QE, basically. So when you're on the desk, you do two things. One is that you try to follow up what's happening in the market and you report to the Fed, uh, senior Fed officials, about what you think is happening. And the second thing you do is you actually run the operation. So when the Fed is doing QE or doing repo or doing FX loans, it's the open markets desk that does that. And I did most of the repo transactions then. So that's what I did when I was there. Great. And, and when did you start working there? I was there from 2016 to 2020. So uh, 2021, sorry. So I was there during COVID as well. It was a very exciting period to see the whole world fall apart around you and be at the very center, one of the very centers of the financial world where you play a big part in helping stabilize everything. Right. So uh, the repo crisis in 2019, September, you were there, but also when it broke down again in March 2020, you were also there. I was I was the first person on the desk in the during the repo crisis in 2019. I got the call from the first panic dealer asking me, hey, Fed, have you looked at what's happening in the repo? I'm like, no. Sit down get 10 more calls instantly the whole phone lights up so i was there it was an exciting time wow amazing and why did you decide to leave the fed um well i got well for me working for the government it's good and it's bad it's good in that you learn a lot of stuff so when you're at the fed you have access to a ton of confidential data and you get access to a lot of people so when something happens in the markets we can call up foreign central banks we can call up banks we can call up dealers big investment fund managers, and they all give us their perspective as to what's happening. So it's a really way to learn about how the world works. But it's a bad place to have a career because the way the government works is that you are judged by your tenure. No one ever gets fired. So in order for you to advance, you just have to sit there and wait for someone else to retire. That's not the kind of work environment that I want. So I just left and now I do my own thing. Yeah, pretty cool. It's always uh, nice when people take uh, such a bold decision and start to work for themselves. Uh, and very much appreciated, of course, by the community because we can all learn so much more from you when you're independent and working for, for the Fed. Thanks, absolutely. A lot of people like me, we go on and be strategists at big banks or big hedge funds when we're basically locked up and we can't talk to people. Um, but I did something different and I'm here on Twitter fairly publicly. I have a blog and happy to help. Yeah, your blog is uh, fedguy.com. Everyone should uh, check it out. Great articles there on a, on a regular basis. So let's um, discuss a few concepts um, because there's, there's a lot of talk about repo markets. You just mentioned uh, you actually were active in, in, in the Fed repo uh, markets uh, when you worked for the Fed. What is what is the, the repo market? Uh, could you ex explain a bit better to our audience what the repo market is? How did it come about and, and why has it become so important? The repo market is the biggest market you've never heard about. So repo was basically a secured loan with treasury. Okay, so I'm going to be more specific here. A secured loan with treasury collateral. So if you have a treasury security, let's say $1,000 worth of treasuries, you can go to the repo market and you can get a loan for cash against that, a secured loan, um, usually overnight in tenure at very low rates. So the size of this market, it's about a trillion dollars every day. Um, it is actually the deepest market in the world. The cash treasury market, in contrast, is about $600 billion in transactions a day. So a trillion dollars in general collateral repo is much bigger. It's a very, very important market because it's one of the pillars that make treasuries money-like. If you have a thousand dollars in U.S. treasuries, it's some, and you want to, let's say, um, buy something, you can either sell that treasury in the cash market or you can borrow against it in repo. It makes treasuries easily convertible to cash, and it's one of the key pillars that make 
Treasury's money like in the financial system. So that's uh, kind of why it's super important. And usually it's a market that's very stable. So if you're doing a trillion dollars every day, it's usually the same people rolling over the same transactions. Um, if you look at the repo rates, it doesn't change very much. So uh, it's a very sleepy market, but it's very, very deep and important. And and if you say you can get cash um, uh, by by putting up collateral in, in the form of treasury notes, what kind of cash is that then? Because there's just so many different money types yeah. in the system. Also in your book, you explain you have reserves, treasuries, yes. there's bank deposits. Um, and if you say cash, what exactly uh, does cash mean in, in this case? That's very, very expert nuance. Um, so to, for more detail, bank deposits, basically. So let's say, Paul, you're an investor and you have a million dollars in treasuries and you want to have some bank deposits. Maybe you want to go buy a new yacht or something like that. But uh, you can just pawn your treasuries for a million dollars in treasuries for a million dollar loan in bank deposits and use that to spend. And eventually you would have to repay it, of course. But if you just wanted to have some cash without selling your treasuries outright, you can just borrow against it. And in the meantime, you're still earning interest on those treasuries as well, although you have to pay the loan interest rate too. Right. And and what is um, then rehypothecation, uh, what you also see a lot uh, in the repo market? Uh, so repo hypothecation is basically, let's say, Paul, you have a million dollars in treasuries and then you repo out for loaning cash. You rep And I, I take your treasuries and I give you the cash. So now I hold treasuries and you have cash. Now, if I can take those treasuries and maybe I go to the repo market and borrow against that. So I go and repo out the securities you gave me and then I get cash back. So it's basically, um, you can think of it as, uh, you pledge your treasuries to me and I repledged it to someone else it, and they can keep pledging it on and on as well. So that would be what rehypothecation is. To me, um, I think of it more as just how fungible treasuries are with cash because at any point along the daisy chain, someone can always take treasuries and convert that to bank deposits. You know, it's just keeps going on and on because treasuries are so fungible with cash. Um, it also, the reason why someone would do this usually is because um, if you are a dealer, a, bit, a dealer or someone who buys and sells securities, um, oftentimes you have to source securities that you want to sell. Um, for example, suppose I'm a dealer and I sold a 10 years treasury security to a hedge fund client. Now, I don't have that security right now. I have to go find it somehow. And maybe you pledged it to me as collateral. Okay, well, I'll just take that security and I'll just deliver it to the hedge fund that I sold to, and maybe tomorrow I'll try to find it back. Uh, it, tomorrow, when I owe, when I want to give it back to you, I have to find it somewhere else. So it's a way to, to shuffle securities along an uh, inventory of securities that dealer holds to help them basically make markets. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, and you mentioned uh, dealers, primary dealers, and your, your book you also mentioned them, of course. Uh, I think they're like 24 in the in the states, um, but they yeah. are not the same as banks, even though they're mostly the same names and companies I see on the list. What is do yeah. they and, and banks have a reserve account at the Fed, but do the um, dealers also have re, have reserve accounts at the Fed? No, they do not. Only people who have bank reserve accounts at the Fed are banks. And okay, so there are other people, but generally speaking, banks. Now, a primary dealer is a business model and they can be done in a bank or they can be outside of the bank. In the US, for the most part, uh, primary dealers have our independent legal entities set up uh, that are not banks, but they are owned by big banks. So JP Morgan, which was a huge bank, they will have a primary dealer, but it would be a separate legal entity, a separate business set up outside of the bank, but owned by the bank. So. JP Morgan primary dealer will not have a Fed account, but they will be owned by JP Morgan, the bank or the holding company. And the holding company um, owns a bank and who has a, who has a reserve account. Uh, but, so there's some nuance here. There are some banks actually that have a primary dealer business. So they run their primary dealer business, not in a separate legal entity, but within their bank. And these tend to be the European banks. 
So, uh, for example, Sok Jen. Sok Jen goes to the U.S. and they open up a branch office in New York. That branch office is a bank. It has a reserve account, but it's also where they run their primary dealer business. So Sok Jen primary dealer then would have a reserve account and be part because it's run out of a out of directly out of their bank. You know, so there's yeah. a different different ways you can organize this. There, it's actually most people. Are like what you said. They, most dealers are like you mentioned. They don't have a reserve account. It's mostly just a few European primary dealers. Right. And in your book, you also uh, mentioned quite a few times that in the past, the Fed also would open a special window for primary dealers and would also lend uh, money to them for hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, but since these dealers don't have a reserve account, that would then be cash lent by the Fed or would the Fed use a commercial bank in in the middle yeah. to actually lend reserve to the commercial bank who then lends uh, so deposits in, to the dealer in practice um when a commercial bank uh, a primary dealer banks with a clearing bank uh let's say bank of new york mellon so when a primary dealer for example goes and borrows from the fed the fed sends reserves to the uh to the account of the of the uh, clearing bank the custodian bank bank of new york mellon and the primary dealer would have an account at Bank of York Mellon. So in the case that you're mentioning, if there's an emergency loan from the Fed to, let's say, a uh, primary dealer, then the primary de the Fed would send, let's say, $100 million to Bank of New York Mellon. Bank of New York Mellon's reserve account would increase by $100 million on the asset side. And on the liability side, they would have $100 million into the deposit account of the primary dealer. So... Right. It would be done through through the commercial banking system. Understood. Makes sense. And and um, bank reserves, they're a special uh, animal. If, if I listen to guys like uh, Jeff Snyder and uh, Alfonso Pecacello, both uh, I had on the show too, they are not very positive about bank reserves. And they seem to be this sort of residual uh, asset in our, in our system that are uh, not very functional uh, if you compare them, for example, with T-bills. Do we really need bank reserves in our current system? Of, would we also be able to do everything with uh, with T bills and, and treasuries instead? No, you you would need reserves. So uh, the reason is because reserves are literally the most liquid asset in the entire banking system. It has zero interest rate risk and instant liquidity. A reserve is just a deposit at the Federal Reserve. So if you're a bank bank, say J P Morgan and you want to pay Citibank, you pay in reserves, and it's done instantly. It's settled instantly. Now, you can't use a security for this purpose because, one, a security, let's say a T-bill or a coupon, it has interest rate risk. So it's, it's not a safe asset. If interest rates go up, then you know your asset is worth less. And the other part is that um, these things usually have a T plus one settlement, so it's not instant liquidity. So if I wanted to, um, if I'm a bank and I wanted to pay something and I had T-bills, I'd have to sell the T-bills first, get the money, and then send the money over. Um, having a lot of reserves in the system makes the system safer because it makes liquidity runs almost impossible. If you think back in the pre-GFC world, uh, oftentimes banks will have go into liquidity crunches. What that means is that um, so generally speaking, banks have longer dated assets and shorter dated liabilities. So if everyone goes to the bank and asks for their money back immediately, the bank can't meet all those withdrawals because they don't have enough liquidity on hand. Um, Pre-GFC, the whole banking system maybe had $50 billion in reserves. So it was very possible that you know a bank could run short on liquidity and then it would have to go borrow on the Fed or fire sell its assets to raise that liquidity. That makes the system more fragile. But we're in a world today where a banking system has, let's say, three and a half, four trillion dollars in reserves. It's almost impossible for there to be any liquidity runs simply because there's just so much liquidity. So it makes the system safer, the banking system safer. Right. Um, and how does the foreign repo pool work? Uh, so there's actually... Um, there's two foreign repo pools actually. They, it's a new one, and there's an old. There's an old one. It's called a foreign, the foreign RP pool. The traditional one is basically um, a deposit account for foreign central banks. So if you're the Bank of Japan, for example, and you have cash 
at the in dollars, where do you put it? Well, you can put it in your Fed account. Yes, you would get a Fed account. Uh, okay, so it, it's a special kind. It, it's something separate. Or you could put it into the foreign repo pool where you would actually earn a little bit of interest. You would earn the repo rate. And so that's what all the foreign sovereigns do. If you have some extra cash, you put it in the foreign repo pool. That is their checking account. And it's secured with treasuries. Um, for, for, for a lot of them, it's, uh, it's more of a legal convenience because if you're a foreign central bank, you don't want to have an unsecured uh, loan to someone. Having a security makes it more conforming to your risk metrics. Right, but the Bank of Japan could also open a reserve account at the Fed, or they they don't have that. Um, uh, so it, it's it's not technically a reserve account, but it's they would get an unsecured deposit account at the Fed. Um, it would be it it wouldn't it would be very similar to a reserve account, but strictly speaking, it would be different. It'd be uh, they would be opening up account in the basically the private foreign banking uh, business of the Fed. So it would be different from the reserve accounts that the commercial banks get, but it functionally it'd be very similar. They would hold what is in effect reserves, but it wouldn't be labeled as such. It's interesting that you said earlier that reserves have no credit risk, but reserves are issued by the Federal Reserve, which is a yeah. private uh, banking um, um, group in a way. Uh, so uh, it, it, the T-bills are issued of... by the government. So in a way, the credit risk of a T-bill should be um, lower than the credit risk of a reserve at the Fed. Or... Uh, well, Fed is basically government. There was a time in the history. So the Fed has an interesting history. In the very beginning of the Fed, um, you know, the the reserve banks, which were, like you mentioned, private, were actually more powerful than the uh, central government Fed. Uh, back then, the Bank of New York would actually call the shots and everyone in Washington would just, you know, okay, I'll do what you say and I rubber stamp it. But over the past, let's say, uh, 80 years, things have really changed. And now all the power is held in Washington, D.C. And the Fed has become very, very much so part of the government and will do what the government says. There, There, there is much less of a private aspect. And I expect that to probably continue in the future. Right. What I noticed, though, is that there's just so many different um, uh, types of money in the system, like we uh, discussed on so many different... Um, programs and, and policy tools uh, that it's become very difficult even for insiders to understand what actually is going on that leads to regular crises like we had the repo crisis in September of 19 we had another repo crisis March of 20 um, every time it seems like something will break or is breaking um, would you agree that the system that we've came up with has become sort of a Frankenstein monster that is almost impossible to keep in check or to control? It's absolutely become very fragile, but there are also things that are being done to make it less fragile. And unfortunately, I, I think most people would not like the things that are being done. So just taking a step back, the financial market, the financial system has grown enormously. Um, just looking at the treasury market, for example, 20 years ago, so I'm gonna say treasury market a lot since I'm based in the US and I know not everyone listening uh, cares about that. But so 20 years ago, we had about seven trillion dollars outstanding in treasury securities. Today we have twenty-three trillion. That's a big jump. And if you look at, let's say, uh, corporate bond market, it's also exploded higher. So, as the financial markets get bigger and, and bigger, they become, it seems, more fragile. Um, this happens because at the center of the financial system, the pipes of the system, the people who are able to make markets, uh, these are called the dealers and many of them are primary dealers, these people don't have enough capacity to, to manage such a large system. When someone sells a security, uh, they sell it to a primary dealer who holds it in their inventory and then sells it to someone else for a slightly higher price. These primary dealers make markets. Uh, th the problem is that the financial market size has grown much faster than their capacity to make markets. So when there are panics and everyone tries to sell at once, the dealers who sit in the center of the system as the pipes of the financial system, they're not able to buy all the securities that are being sold to them. And so when that happens, there's panic because people who want to sell, they can't sell to get the money that they want. And then so they lower their price and their fire sales and everything crashes. That's what happened in 2020 during March. 
um, everyone was trying to sell the dealers who, who again who make markets in these in, in in all assets were not able to accommodate them because their capacity to make markets did not grow as fast as the size of the financial markets. So the system crashed, treasury markets crashed, corporate bonds crashed, equities crashed, everything just kind of blew up. That's a source of tremendous fragility. Um, the way that these authorities fixed this was the authorities, especially the Fed came in and they started to be the market maker of last resort. So you're selling treasuries and you know the dealers don't have capacity to buy them from you, that's okay, the Fed will buy from you. And you're, um, let's say you're a corporation, you're trying to sell your debt and no one can, no one wants to lend to you, that's okay, the Fed will lend to you. The Fed is basically becoming uh, the market maker of last resort for the capital markets, treasuries, corporate debt, and so forth. And that seems to be the solution to uh, fragility in the system, socializing everything. Um, the way that these things work is, so Ronald Reagan, a uh, former US president, had a saying, the closest thing to eternal life is a government program. So now that we have this program here where the Fed has been trained to be able to come into the market, including the treasury market, including the, um, uh, say, the state and local government market that just lend and buy, buy securities, that's probably just going to grow in the future. So the next time something breaks, it'll just be the government there socializing everything acting as the buyer and seller of last resort. Which is, of course, a huge moral hazard then, eh? because we had uh, and the bailouts during the great financial crisis. And again, we've seen then in March of 2020 that the system was built out and, and a trillion a month was created by the Fed out of thin air, which, uh, of course, benefited the pe people people that had those assets, assets that were built out in the first place. So is that something um, that society is going to except in the long run that we keep on bailing out the, the, the elite, the, basically. So they'll tell you that, yeah, it's not bailing out the elite, you're bailing out you. After all, the people who own the assets are the pension funds, the firemen, the teachers, the hardworking people. But of course, that's, that, 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 that's, that's kind of true. But of course, like you mentioned, it's mostly the people who are rich um, because they own most of the financial wealth. So the, the system actually has a, have a very predictable end to this, and, and that's inflation. So the moral hazard to this is that you always just, you know, open the money skibigots, save everyone, not just in the financial market side, but what we've seen uh, last time is also on the fiscal side. Guys, you're in trouble. Okay, we'll send you some checks. Everything will be okay. You can't pay your student loans. That's okay. I'll forgive it. So this is just an easy, easy way out for everyone. And the conclusion is just so predictable. It's going to be very significant inflation. And we've seen that now, um, but nothing goes in a straight line. We'll probably recede a bit, but eventually that, that seems to be the inevitable conclusion because it's the easiest. I mean, who wants to say, you guys didn't want to have to eat deflation. I'm sorry. Uh, the, it's the winning, the winning political argument is to be like, I'll give you money. Right. So yeah. that, and that's what, that's what we're going to go. Short term gain for long term pain. Uh, to, yes. But, yeah. but when a long term, it's someone else's problem, the politician, he's already gone, right? Yeah, he's, exactly. You vote for me and someone problem is someone else's 10 years from now. Yeah, so we're going to talk inflation uh, um, afterward, but I first wanted to uh, talk a bit about the euro dollar um, market, uh, which I really don't like as a term euro dollar because it's constantly confusing people because it has nothing to do, of course, with the euro dollar exchange rate. So I prefer your term, the offshore dollar system. It's much more um, uh, telling and um, you avoid this uh, stupid confusion. So the, the offshore dollar system is really well explained in your book because it was always a bit of a, a difficult uh, concept for me, but the, the offshore dollar system is, is, is not that difficult to understand if you read your book. So uh, great job. Uh, but I still don't understand though how, um, for example, Russian entities that are sanctioned at the moment are able to use the euro, euro dollar system. Um, uh, that, that's that point I don't understand because you wrote in your, in your book that in 2014 BNP Paribas was fined a huge $9 billion fine for assisting offshore banks in uh, avoiding sanctions uh, um, on, on Iran and, and some other countries. Um, but I, I understand right now, also talking to, Je to Jeff Snyder, that the euro or the offshore dollar system is still being used um, intensively by Russian actors, for example. So 
how come the, the commercial banks in the US who support offshore banks with deposits, how come they are allowed to, to, to do that with Russian entities? Yeah, that's because the Russian sanctions are just for publicity. Uh, you can actually see this very clearly in the oil market. You say that you're not buying Russian oil. So what happens? The Russians are selling the oil to the Middle Easterners and to India, and then they turn around and they sell it to Europe. Voila, Russian oil production just as high as it was. Um, the uh, the the banking sanctions are the same. They're just for show. So very very. So this is crazy, but. On the Treasury's website, I was I did a podcast with Francis Coppola on this, and uh, and she mentioned, and I've seen it on the Treasury's website. There's actually a diagram that shows you what you can do and you cannot do for Russian sanctions, and it basically teaches you how to avoid the sanctions. So let's say you are a Russian bank, and you, the United States cannot deal with you. Okay, the diagram says this is what you should do. You can open a bank account in a third country bank, let's say in India or let's say in Europe or somewhere. And then you you have an account in that bank in a third country and then have that third country make and receive dollar payments for you. And that's okay. So uh, like you mentioned, it's just taking advantage of the Euro dollar banks. So the US entities cannot deal with Russian banks, but they can deal with third country banks. So Russian entities have a open up account at a bank in India and then use that bank to send stuff to, it doesn't have to be India, just as an example, to uh, to people in the US. So it's not a real sanction. It's just like everything else. It's mostly for political stuff. Yeah. If they really wanted to sanction, they could. And that's what they did to Iran. And that is essentially prohibiting dollar clearing out of the US banking system. You cannot process any dollar payments on behalf of any Russian entities. If they did that, that would be the nuclear option. Uh, that that that's that's what they did to Iran. And so when Iran wants to sell things, they have to barter. They have to sell with oil or sell with gold or something like that. Um, but they did not do that to, to in this case. Okay, so because I thought that um, then Russian entities could still use a myriad of other um, yeah. other uh, entities uh, in between them and and. Uh, American banks who actually have the reserve accounts at the Fed, because in the end, of course, the, the these transactions have to be settled in reserves uh, at the end of the of the chain. But that they just put a lot of uh, entities in between, and that uh, they, um, people will never find out, or the Fed or, or American banks cannot find out what the ultimate counter parties uh, were in, in a certain transaction. Or you're saying they they are able to to find out all the entities involved in a certain transaction and then stop the transaction from being cleared. They want uh, so that has to do with the KY know your customer compliance laws. It, like you mentioned, it's hard to do and they try hard to do it. But sometimes, you know, the banks help out because they can make a lot of money doing these transactions. And in the BNP case that you mentioned, they're helping Iran and they lost a billion dollars. A billion dollar fine is enormous. So banks try not to do this because once they're caught, the penalties are very high. So if the US really wanted to get someone out of the dollar clearing system. It's hard to enforce, like you mentioned, and they make up for this by making the penalty very high. So once they figure it out, you're going to be fined enormously that you'll never want to do this again. Um, in the Russian case, they did not kick them out of the dollar clearing system. They very, It was very gentle, very obvious what they can do. Like you mentioned, you just have an, you just add one more counterparty into, to, in, into the chain that is not Russian. A bank somewhere else and then you're fine and they've made it very clear on the treasury's official website telling you about sanctions how you could be a compliant with that so uh yeah. i did i can send you that chart later if you like um so it's it's uh it's it wasn't a real it, it, they weren't very serious about doing this uh, what about swift want. how important is swift in this uh in this um uh, swift is situation a, swift is a swift is like the messaging system it's so um if if you're a bank and you want to send uh money to another bank you would use it through swift it, it's like your special fax fax network or your uh, special internet or something like that losing swift would be like losing the internet uh, it makes your life harder because you can't send this message as easily uh, but it can still be done um Maybe you you do a phone call, and of course it's much harder to uh, 
mass to transmit a thousand transactions to a phone call than it is through electronic transmission, but it can still be done. Uh, it, it's more of an inconvenience than anything else. The, the gold standard for getting rid of someone out of the dollar system is just telling, just saying that we're not going to clear any of your dollar transactions. That means, you know, you, no more settlement and reserves at the end of the day, like you mentioned, and that really freezes you out of, out of global trade because a bulk of global trade is conducted in dollars. Yeah, understood. You, you've seen a, a few other initiatives now as, as a result of the war in, in Ukraine where um, the Chinese are, are trying to set up their own um, clearing system and the Russians are doing it too. The Russians have the SPFS and China has the, the SIPs. Um, do you expect those types of initiatives to pick up more steam in the, the, the years to come? you expect the, the dollar in that sense to become less dominant in global trade? It's really hard to do that. So the impetus for that is that they froze the uh, foreign reserves of the Russian Central Bank. Well, that's that's kind of a big deal. Uh, so if you are if you're a country, you you eventually through trade you accumulate dollars or euros as, as basically like your rainy day fund, and it's really important for you to have that because you know, say one day, um, like bad things happen and your ex your currency is getting very weak. Um, you can use those rainy day funds in dollars or euros to defend them. And that's what it seems Russia planned, that one day, if anything happened to their uh, to their currency, to their economy, they could have these rainy day funds that they could use. Now, these rainy day funds, they're deposits that are held on foreign central banks. Um, you assume them to be risk-free because foreign central banks don't default on you. But in this case, under political pressure, they essentially confiscated them or froze them. So the the, it's like going into your logging into your bank account and realizing that all the millions of dollars that you've saved, you actually can't withdraw any. And that makes a lot of people very nervous because what if one day, let's say I'm India and uh, someone in the US says, your economy is not green enough. You're burning too much coal. So you're going to stop burning coal or I'm going to take away your foreign reserves. Why? Well, that, that that's not good. It gives you a lot of power over someone. So people will try to find alternatives around that. Um, one of them is just using other payment networks like Russia and China's payment networks, like you mentioned. That means that that means the U.S. Federal Reserve will not have the ability to just freeze. Uh, you won't have an account. You won't have an account at the Fed, or won't hold a lot of money there. Then they won't be even if they freeze your account. You'll be able to use other means of payment. I think that's going to be more popular, but it's a long shot uh, because everyone uses dollars. It's like a. It's like let's say. You, there's a network effect. Like if you use Visa or MasterCard, you like using it because it's easily accepted. Now, if you you have a new network coming out, uh, you're not going to want to use it because you not many people can accept that as a means of payment. Uh, from my view, actually, there's an easy way out of this, and that's instead of keeping your foreign reserves at a deposit at the Fed or at a European Central Bank, you can just keep it all in currency. Like you can just withdraw hundred million dollars, hundred billion dollars out of the Fed, have fat stacks of currency like a Mexican drug dealer, and just keep it in your vaults. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, if you do that, uh, you're not afraid of sanctions because they can't take it from you. It's in it's in your, it's in your vault. Yeah, but I'm not. I don't think uh, the Fed would allow that. So they they wouldn't be able no. to, and I'm willing no, no. to ship so many uh, notes to uh, to Russia. Ah, here's the thing, though. This is the crazy thing that people don't really realize. So the currency outstanding in the US, it's about $2.1 trillion. Most of that is actually abroad. Now, if you're abroad and you have, let's say you're, let's say you're Barclays, you have a reserve account. You're saying, I need $100 million in currency. The Fed will send it to you. That's, that's your job. No questions asked. So most cash in, in existence is held outside of the US. It's in, maybe people in Argentina, maybe drug lords in, in, in Mexico, something like that. So uh, it, maybe if you suddenly said, maybe if China called up and said, you know, I have a trillion dollars in treasuries, I want a trillion dollars in currency, $100 bills unmarked sent to me. They probably won't do that. But if you do it slowly, I, I think you, I think it could work.
Yeah, so Russia was perhaps smart enough to um, accumulate gold and and, yeah. and lower yeah. their dollar holdings, uh, but they were still naive to keep so much in their reserve account, uh, even though they could have asked for uh, Federal Reserve notes instead. Yes, okay. gold is good too, but diversify, right? You got to have some currency, you got to have some gold. Gold, uh, cash, Bitcoin, it's it's could have been a good combination. <laughs> well, man, if, if they ever show up, like file their statements and show Bitcoin, I think Bitcoin people are going to go crazy. They're going to be like, look, we're winning. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and the dollar has been appreciating a lot, uh, of course, because the Fed is, is um, hawkish, especially compared to other central banks. Um, but that leads to a lot of stress in the system, uh, especially in emerging markets and also in the euro dollar market, I would say. Could, could you um, elaborate what, what the knock-on effects are of Fed policy in, in, in the euro dollar system and in emerging markets? Uh, so Fed is trying to tamper down inflation and a stronger dollar is an expressed goal of the Fed right now. Jay Powell has been very open about that. He says he wants a stronger dollar because it helps tamping down on, on inflation. Um, a stronger dollar has a lot of knock-on effects in the global financial system because of the euro dollar system. So um, broadly speaking, there's a lot of people in emerging markets that borrow in dollars. They borrow in dollars for a number of reasons. So if you're, let's say, a company in Mexico, maybe you're involved in foreign trade. So, you know, you need dollars, so you're borrowing dollars. Sometimes it's because usually dollar interest rates are lower than your local interest rate. Uh, U.S. interest rates have been very low for the past 10 years, and emerging markets have been a lot higher. So you save money if you borrow in dollars. And the dollar markets, they're also much deeper. So uh, if you're in, let's say, South Africa, capital market's not as developed as the dollar markets. It's, and you want to borrow a lot of money, it's, it's easier to borrow in dollars because there's a lot of dollars out there. So these, all these foreign companies, they borrow in dollars. And the problem is that their asset side, uh, they're located in a foreign country. So their asset side is oftentimes in a local currency. So when the dollar strengthens, that means their liabilities become more expensive. Which, which is to say it'll take more local currency to repay their dollar debt because their, their currency has depreciated. So that creates tremendous stress for the companies in, in, who have these dollar loans. Their debt is essentially becoming bigger in local currency terms. That has knock-on effects for their big foreign banking system as well. A lot of banks made these loans to these companies and now they're sitting on loans that are maybe not as promising as they used to be. So that creates stress in the financial system, in the banking system, which means banks are less willing to make loans because maybe they might have more losses. And so that trickles down to less credit creation, uh, less credit creation, there's less growth. So it's it's definitely a very strong negative for, for the emerging markets. And you can see that in their stocks. Uh, emerging market equities have, have um, you know, basically gone to the toilet for the past year so it's a, it's it's a... On, if you look at um, fed's policy uh, and of course you understand uh, they want to high rates in order to tame inflation but then that the, it could be that it will break the offshore dollar market then if, if a lot of offshore banks are going to be confronted with the defaults of their borrowers and um, but also sovereign uh, defaults we're going to see a lot the coming time as well we've already seen quite a few countries like Sri Lanka is uh, could that be another element and or another part of the financial system that will break uh, as a result of, of uh, policymakers in the US that sounds like it would be helpful for global inflation right now I'm not saying that's their intention goal but if you're if you're the Fed and you're like I got a hike rates to get inflation down because inflation is nine percent and my goal is two well, someone somewhere breaks, that's very sad, but that actually helps my goal because if you have some kind of distress in the emerging markets, well, that means just less demand for global commodities. There's less growth, there's less, oh, so that, that's actually helpful for achieving the goal. The Fed doesn't actually, I mean, it, the Fed's mandate is not to care about what happens in, in the periphery of the financial world. I'm sure they don't want to cause any harm, but, um, it's 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 if it if it gets in the way of achieving inflation then then that's that's an unfortunate
but it's a lot of collateral damage then possibly if you look at all the hunger um, riots and all the uh, people suffering in emerging markets as a result also of, of fed policy is that something that within the fed is being discussed amongst the policymakers that uh, perhaps uh, um, you need to be more mindful as an institution of, of the knock-on effects in, in, in those countries? Well, I think that th there's a lot of moving parts to this, though. So you have a lot of hunger in in, in uh, emerging country markets, but a lot of that is, is actually not due to the financial policies, but it's due to the decision to sanction Russia. So it's about the political decisions of the European Union and of the U.S. government. It, it's not so much the Fed. And they'll blame it on Russia, but it's really the sanctions that cause this. So it, there's a lot of blame to, to go around. Uh, the Fed has a very narrow job, and it's to help domestic inflation. The concerns of those other concerns, they could be important, but they'd have to go through other parts of the government, um, you know, like, say, the elected parts of the government. Yeah, right. And, and would it be possible that um, other countries or companies will lose faith in the dollar uh, if, if this um, dollar milkshake theory basically that, that Brent Johnson talks about always is that um, there will be a shortage of dollars in some of these countries, the dollar will go up and some of the, these countries will default, which will eventually lead to a, a, a loss of confidence in the use of dollar as a global currency. Could that happen? Well... I, loss of confidence in strong dollar to me that doesn't make sense if you lose confidence in the dollar then it wouldn't be strong so i think the dollar system can break uh, but it would only break if it was too strong as brent johnson's milkshake theory notes you know dollar strengthening and it's going to create lots of stress in the world that's actually in my view what would break the dollar system because it becomes too painful to use dollars dollars right. become too expensive uh, not because I don't have confidence in it, but because it's caused me too much pain. The paradox is that a weak dollar actually greatly strengthens the dollar system because when the dollar is weak, then the dollars, you can cheaply borrow it. And, you know, if you can cheaply borrow dollars, you would choose that instead of borrowing in pesos. So um, it's actually that weak dollar is makes the dollar system grow because more people want to use it. Having a strong dollar does break the system, makes it painful to use the dollars, and uh, could force them to use maybe their own currency or other currencies that that are not as expensive. Um, it's just that you know you you have to cause I think a lot more pain than you have now. Yeah, but that's of course the dilemma, the paradox that uh, the U.S. has to deal with as the issue of the world currency. That uh, on the one hand you have domestic objectives like taming inflation, on the other hand the world is screaming for more dollars. Though it's the, impossible, perhaps, to hit both targets. The, the Fed would tell you that that's true. But if you're a foreign central bank, you have tools to deal with this as well. Oh, okay. So let's say the dollar is too strong, then you can raise interest rates that will make the dollar weaker. Um, yeah, I mean, so that's that's true as well. So it's not all about, it's not all one-sided. An exchange rate, you know, it's there's two parts to it. Yeah. So, I'm, I, I hope uh, Lagarde is listening to you, of course, because with, uh, within the Eurozone, uh, the ECB is uh, I know. Just, uh, very hesitant when it comes to uh, raising rates. What is, what's your take on ECB policy at the moment? Uh, you know, I, I watched Lagarde and I just can't believe she's the head of the ECB. <laughs> uh, it's just so, so crazy, like just doesn't seem to understand what she's doing. And that seems to show in her policy. But I, I have to be fair, though. She has a very tough job. Because, of course, unlike the U.S., there's not as much demand-driven inflation in the Eurozone as there is in the U.S. So if you have demand-driven inflation, it's easy. You raise rates, tapping down on demand, and hope that slows down inflation. In the Eurozone, it's mostly energy crisis, energy shock. And that, that's, that's a harder situation to deal with. Um, that being said, I think raising interest rates can also be effective in negative supply shocks. Uh, the way that you can see this is to just look over the past few months, Fed raised rates and all the commodities imploded. Uh, I think this is because that the commodity market, even though you think of commodities as physical, there's actually a very large financial component. A lot of commodities is driven by the paper market. So, you know, if the financial markets crash because the Fed is raising rates, oil market's going to crash too. And the oil market crashes, aluminum and, 
you know, steel, iron, they, they all crash too. And they did. So um, that mechanically brings down the physical market as well because the paper and the physical are right together. So I think it does work. And that's probably what she, she should be doing is raising rates. And she is. Slowly uh, but just, slowly but sure, yeah. Very, very slowly, yeah. Yeah. All right. what, what do you think? Is the euro um, sustainable uh, in, in, let's say, the five, five or 10 years? Or do you think it will eventually um, break because of the lack of a true political union? I, I, mean, I think it's a political decision. I'm going to have to defer to you, Paul, to tell me about the European politics. Uh, I think they, they can, they could keep it together if they want. The ECB would just have to break more principles and start monetizing everyone's debt. Uh, so they can keep it together if they want to. But I think the question is, do the people want this to continue? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, what do you think? Well, I'm not sure if it matters what the people want, because quite often the people spoke out against uh, the euro and uh, through referenda, for example, or through when it comes to further uh, expanding European Union or further intensifying cooperation, quite often there, there, there was a no vote and the vote was disregarded. Um, so I'm not sure if it really matters what the people want, but it seems they're going to continue anyway with, uh, uh, with, with further um, integrating and expanding until a moment where, where the people are really fed up with it, especially I would say in the North. Uh, and now with this new TPI mechanism by the ECB, we could also see some backlash, especially um, in Germany and Holland, if it's, it turns out that um, the Italians, for example, are further subsidized. Uh, so we, yeah, we'll have to see how, how things go and what the um, effects and consequences are of this policy. But if inflation keeps on um, uh, being at a high level and, and more money is flowing to the south, then voters in the north could at some point revolt against the whole concept of the euro. Yeah, that, that, that sounds like it'd be a very good time for you to go down to Italy and buy a vacation home. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should. And so what is your view on, on inflation in the, in the U.S.? I read this new Zoltan Pozar's uh, piece where he, he thinks it will be uh, much uh, stickier and higher because of the economic war basically between the West and the East. Um, yet if you look at the yield curves, um, which, which are strongly and, and, and deeply uh, inverted, um, one would say that the market thinks inflation will go down a lot the coming years to probably close to two or three percent. Um, but it's been quite sticky over the past year already, and, and most uh, market uh, participants didn't see that coming. What what do you expect uh, inflation to be, and, and how high is the Fed going to hike? Yeah, I think the first thing to realize is that the market is not a good predictor of the future. Uh, if you just rewind two years ago, you'll see that none of the market anticipated a 10% CPI that we have, well, 9% CPI that we have today. If you go back, let's say the past 10 years, the short-term interest rate market has basically always been very, very wrong about the path of Fed policy. So market is not smart when it comes to predicting the future. If you look at what the Fed said, and Fed commentators like myself and, and Zoltan are, are pretty much all on the same page when we look at this, is that the Fed last time was pretty clear that they're going to keep hiking rates and they're going to keep uh, keep rates to be pretty elevated uh, throughout 2023. That's what Jay Powell hinted at, and that's what the Fed speakers this week have been coming out trying to emphasize. The market is, is not listening, but I suspect that the Fed is going to uh, carry out their plans. The reason being that inflation is not so easy to get rid of. Uh, when I think about inflation, I think that it will come down when people can no longer afford the higher prices. How do people afford higher prices? They do so out of one out of three ways. One is wages, two is borrowing, and three is just their asset wealth. And if you look at all the three of those measures, they're very high. In the US, wage gains are uh, 5% year over year. And if you have 5% wage gains, there's no way inflation is going back to 2% because you're making so much money in raises every year. You can afford to buy lots of stuff. Same thing for credit growth, 10% year over year. And if you look at asset prices, well, the S&P keeps going higher. It's not as high as it was early in the year, but it, it's still pretty close to all-time highs. So people have a lot of money to keep supporting higher prices. So it's hard to see inflation going down uh, back towards 2%. 
where the Fed would like it. So the Fed is going to have to keep hiking rates uh, until we see uh, unemployment increase. So wage increases slow down and until asset prices go down, uh, we're very far from that. Uh, it's, it's actually amazing to me to see that the market thinks that the Fed is immediately going to start cutting uh, next year. And I think, I think the Fed is, doesn't like seeing that, which is why they have so many speakers out this week pushing against it. Funny because they always say don't fight the Fed, but it seems the market is trying to fight the Fed. Yeah, yeah they, they don't. So they don't fight the Fed in the past always being suggested, you know, buy the dip, buy the dip, buy the dip. And that worked out really well. Um, like him suggested, don't fight the Fed means something completely different now. And I think the market is, well, there are many people who are still trying to learn what that was this new don't fight the Fed means. Yeah, but if the Fed goes too far in hiking and they're also going to do QT, of course, and QT would probably mean also that the yield curve would steepen a bit more, I would say, because they would probably offload a lot of uh, uh, longer term um, securities. Uh, but would that be then possible for society to to handle? Because we have a lot of debt. Um, the debt to GDP ratio, public plus private, is, is, is a record high. Can we handle um, much higher interest rates, or is, is that also going to break the system possibly? Um, so I think you make a very good distinction between public and private. So public debt is never a problem at all at the board's the central bank can always buy it all, right? So that's what the central bank has been doing in, in the in the U.S. and in Europe and in Japan for for the past ten years. Public debt can is not a problem at all. So that's not something we should worry about. Private debt, though, now if you're a private debtor, you don't have a money printer, so it's possible that you will, will default on your loans. I I don't actually worry about that, but it's going to be different for every country. In the U.S households your biggest debt is your home mortgage and mortgage rates so u.s mortgages are special in that we we usually can borrow for 30 years and we have the option of refinancing when rates drop over the past year rates were as low as two and a half percent everyone refinanced and locked in uh 2.5 percent for 30 years and if you have 2.5 percent interest rates and wages are going up five percent inflation is 9%, then that can't be a problem. In fact, your debt is going to disappear in real terms very quickly. So that's that's not a big problem. Some corporations um, have shorter dated debt, let's say three to five years. And when they roll over their debt in the future, they're going to have to pay higher interest rates. But you have to remember, inflation is high. That means that prices are going higher, corporate revenues are going higher as well. So they're going to be able to um, I think they'll be able to make their interest rate payments because their their revenue is going higher. That's what inflation is all about. If you look at real interest rates, which is interest rates correcting for um, inflation, they're still very low. They're around close to zero. So it's you know it's hard to see debt being a problem when you have massive inflation. Inflation is what eats away debt, right? Yeah. So you don't think yield curve control is going to be use them there in, in, in the US, uh, if, if I understand you correctly? Uh, no, it could be used, um, but it would be used as a way. To, um, so if you if you think back to what we talked about earlier, that the financial system keeps going bigger and bigger, but the underlying pipes of the system, the dealers can't manage such a large amount of financial assets, and sometimes they break. Um, yield curve control would be another solution to this. So for example, um, let's say that something breaks in the market in the future and everyone tries to sell their market, but not necessarily to control interest rates, but to maintain stability, like a, like a backup option. Um, you know, for example, uh, in the, the Fed has FX swap lines, right? So that means that when the dollars get too expensive in Europe, you can always go to borrow from the Fed. That puts a backstop as to how high rates can go. You can do the same thing using yield curve control. You put a limit as to how high yields can go. Uh, it's a it's just a backstop in the financial markets. Interesting. Well, thanks a lot. Um, maybe one one or two more questions if you're okay with that. Um, sure, happy what's to help. Your, what's your take on gold? So I was really frustrated by gold. You know, I actually I was a big I owned a lot of gold earlier in the year, and, and I you know I, I lost a lot on it, and I I'm out of it right now. So listen. 
inflation is at nine percent, gold is going down the toilet. I don't think anyone expects that, right? No. Um, I think gold has a use, but not in from so much as inflation, but more of as a hedge from government. So let me explain. So if you think back to what happened in Canada just uh, last year or earlier in the year, you know, government doesn't like these people protesting. So what do they do? They freeze your bank accounts. They take everything from you. So in the future, we're probably heading towards a world where the government is going to be more open about doing things like this. If you if they don't like you, they'll be able to freeze you out from the electronic world. And they have all the control over the electronic world. Uh, if you have some gold or something that's out of the banking system, you have something that's of value that they can't touch. Um, so I think that that's where, where the value is, being able to have something that, um, that, that can't easily be confiscated or destroyed by... by by, by the government. So, you know, this sounds paranoid and all that, but listen, would you Coming expect- Coming from a former Fed trader, it does sound a bit paranoid, but I, I, I totally feel you. And I, I think cash and, and Bitcoin are basically in the same category. Yeah. So, I mean, Bitcoin is also, also not part of the bank system. It is metal, but I don't, I, something that's electronic is vulnerable to, to many things. So something that is something you can hold in your hand. Um, vulnerable to different things, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So- I, I, I want to hold some physical gold, just, uh, just diversify my assets outside of the banking system. Interesting. Well, any uh, closing remarks uh, from your end, uh, Joseph? I really uh, enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think something is something big is happening in the world that, that we don't really see, and that is that there are these big demographic shifts that are going to make the coming years years of times of very high inflation. And what's happening today that hasn't happened in the past hundred years is that the amount of people who are working is shrinking. So the past hundred years, if you look at demographic profiles, the amount of working people continues to increase all the time, not just uh, in the US, but globally. For example, you had China and India joining the global labor force, but that's all gone now. Um, we have very low birth rates and we have older people living longer than they used to. So we have basically fewer people working and more people that are dependent upon the fewer people working. These are the increasingly retired people. So you're going to have tremendous shortages of labor. Uh, that's just going to get worse. And this is part of what we see during COVID. And COVID, uh, wages go higher, not just in the US, but out everywhere in the world because people can't find workers. Where did the workers go? They retired early. So you're seeing this glimpse of our aging workforce through more retirements happening and that's going to change i think a lot of a lot of how policy is and a lot of how um what happened in the past decades so the past decades you know workers got screwed people who had money uh, they became richer but maybe there's a reversal here people who work will be making more money and because interest rates have to rise to keep inflation in control people who own financial assets uh, they won't be making as much money as they used to and should policymakers offset that by more immigration from, for example, in Europe to allow more Africans to uh, to migrate or in the States to allow more um, Latinos to, to migrate? Or I'm, on a global scale, it doesn't matter because it's basically going from does, the one bucket to the other bucket. Yeah, it, it, so on a global scale, it doesn't really matter because the whole global the population is shrinking. So um, it, it's temporary anyway. Uh, but, you know, immigration causes a lot of other concerns as well. Do, do these people integrate well? Um, are they able to contribute in the same way as, as the current citizens? And, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of considerations that have to be uh, worked out when, when thinking about that. Yeah. So that's something for people to, to keep an eye on uh, demographic uh, shifts and trends for the years to come. And, and uh, what you're seeing is that it will be inflationary and, and, so that's another um, um, dragon that has to be uh, slayed by um, by uh, Paul and Lagarde, or at least another variable that they have to uh, consider when setting policy, right? Yeah. Okay, well, thanks a lot, uh, Joseph. Uh, people should definitely uh, read and buy your book, Central Banking 101. Uh, I'm looking forward to... Uh, to a, a, a sequel, but I'm not sure if it's coming. Uh, we discussed it prior to the show. <laughs> I would appreciate it, but... I, I'd love to. I, I'm still working on it. Okay, perfect. And, uh, and people can look you up at, um, at fatguy.com and, of course, uh, on Twitter at uh, fatguy. Thanks, Paul. Thanks a lot, Joseph.